So thank you all so much for coming. Um, I'm sorry I'm um, tethered a little bit um, back here so that I can um, work on the presentation. But uh, I'm Michelle Ehrenberg. I'm the uh, executive director and co-founder of Lyft Louisiana. And I'm really, really pleased to be here tonight. And I want to thank um, the, the college for letting us use this space and Chantrell and Sally for working with me on putting this event together. Um, we are kind of doing a road show uh, around, the, around the state. We've already done one of these events in Shreveport and we're doing one in Baton Rouge this weekend in New Orleans next week. We had to cancel the one, um, the North Shore in Abita Springs, but we're gonna be rescheduling that and we'll be working also to schedule one in Ruston. So if you know people in any of those areas that you think might be interested in this content, you know, please invite them to come. They're all, all, all of the events are on Facebook. So. Um, for those of you who don't know um, about, uh, you know, our we've, we've done these in the past, not as many of them as we're doing this year. Um, this was a very interesting legislative session um, on uh, off years, on um, odd number years. So uh, the session is a fiscal session, so they really are supposed to be dealing with the budget, and usually there's not a whole lot of kind of controversial bills that come up during budget sessions because they're really just supposed to be working on the budget. Uh, however, this year was unusual, and uh, I think that a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's an election year. Um, so there were some really interesting outcomes. So today what we wanna do is, um, is to, you know, talk a little bit about some of the bills that um, Lyft Louisiana was following and what the outcomes of those were. And then I also um, wanted to give an update on some pending litigation that is happening around reproductive um, rights in, uh, in that's relevant to Louisiana. Uh, and then we're gonna, um, you know, have a little bit of a discussion about what are things that we can do, and we're going to ask you guys, uh, if you're willing, to uh, to actually participate in uh, a thank you note writing um, exercise. Um, so, you can also interrupt me at any time if you have questions, because we are such a small group. So, um, who is Lift Louisiana? So, we are a reproductive rights organization, and our mission is to educate, to advocate, and litigate for policy changes that would improve the health and well-being of Louisiana women, their family, and their communities. So, that's kind of a mouthful, um, but fundamentally, we are uh, focused on making sure that the policies that are put forward in Louisiana are actually um, making our communities better by changing the lives of women in particular. Particular. So this legislative session, um, we were focused on um, kind of three general um, issue areas. So first was the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, next, we, we focused on economic justice, and so under that, we uh, worked on equal pay uh, legislation, on minimum wage, on paid family leave, and on the pink tax, which I'll explain as we go through. Uh, and then we also worked on reproductive justice issues um, and all the uh, restrictions on abortions that were proposed and passed um, this legislative session. Um, just to be clear, our position was opposing um, the restrictions on abortion. So um, the Equal Rights Amendment, um, so Louisiana um, could have been the 38th state um, and the last state needed to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. And so the Equal Rights Amendment is a very, very, very simple um, proposed amendment to the United States Constitution that would guarantee equal rights for women. Um, and uh, it's something that, I think it's really important. Um, it was originally proposed, you know, um, shortly after the um, the Nineteenth Amendment um, was ratified, and um, and then there was kind of a, a new um, fight around it in the '70s. And um, here we are today, and we um, have 37 states that have ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. We need one more state to ratify, and um, you know, it was a really interesting. Um, debate uh, this session. The bill was introduced by Senator J.P. Morrell, who's a, um, a senator uh, 
from the New Orleans area, and it was opposed by um, the Louisiana Right to Life and the Family Forum. So I have some videos just so you guys can get a little bit of an idea about what the opposition um, to, uh, to these bills were. So the first one is, um, is actually JP responding to the Louisiana Right to Life's testimony um, against the bill in the Senate committee when it was first um, heard this session. We heard about equal pay. Let me be honest, I've authored equal pay legislation. You guys know you're in all the committees with it. I have not seen Louisiana Right to Life or the Family Forum show up one time in support of equal pay. Hmm. If you support women having babies, you support them being paid equally to take care of their kids. So if you're for the family, I've got two bills tomorrow. I've got a bill in committee tomorrow on equal pay. I hope to see you there. So um, we clipped that and we put it up on our Facebook page because I think that it pretty much summed up the controversy around um, around this bill pretty well. So the next, the next um, one. Senator Morell, I appreciate your thoughts. This is Senator I, I appreciate your thoughts. And as a woman, we just had a, a resolution recognizing 100 years since we received the right of suffrage. But I rise today as a woman, as a mother, as a grandmother that wants a clear understanding of why I'm voting no. And it's going to be a difficult thing to explain to women. I want my granddaughter to know why I voted no. And I want to be really clear, I'm going to focus on one aspect of the discussion. We, we have a situation right now where, and I've passed the quote out, there is a connection to abortion and the ERA. And if you look at the quote, it says, with this ratification, the ERA would reinforce the constitutional right to abortion by clarifying that the sexes have equal rights, which would require judges to strike down anti-abortion laws. So this is just one aspect. There, there's lots of points we could discuss, but I'm standing here as a woman in Louisiana that 100 years could not have voted, and I'm a state senator. I believe that I have the right to accomplish what I set out for. I, I, I really look r hard at what rights I'm lacking that would allow me to do something I can't do right now. So I think that this is, you know, this was the biggest point of opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, so, you know, all the people that came up and opposed it and all the legislators that voted against it, fundamentally they were just opposed to and, and the idea that the Equal Rights Amendment might actually uh, be applicable to, uh, to abortion access. Um, and uh, so it was, it was a very interesting debate. And unfortunately it did fail. Uh, and uh, I think that there were only nine senators that that actually stood and voted um, for the Equal Rights Amendment. So we have a lot of work to do there. So I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a snapshot of sort of what um, you know, sort of the state of economic insecurity in Lafayette is just by numbers. Obviously, you guys live here, so you know. Um, but um, so I pulled out like four of the um, Senate districts in the in the area and, um, you know, just wanted to sort of highlight what is happening, you know, the rate of people that are living in poverty, the rate of children living in poverty, um, how many people in the community are, um, are recipients of, of SNAP, of food stamp benefits, um, just to give you an idea of you know, the sh how people sort of are struggling in this area um, because, um, you know, three out of these four senators consistently vote against um, all of the bills that would actually uh, increase people's wages, um, provide for equal pay, or other otherwise create more economic security for families in Louisiana. So, Again, we worked on equal pay. Um, Senator J.P. Morrell carried that bill as well. Uh, that bill was really focused this year on um, ending pay secrecy. So in Louisiana, 
if you discuss your wages with another employee at a company, you can be fired. The, the company can retaliate against you and fire you for discussing your wages. And so the proposal that um, Senator Morell put forward would have prohibited that kind of retaliation from, uh, from business owners against uh, employees for having conversations. And the reason that this is important is because how are you ever going to know that you are being paid unequal if you don't know what your coworkers are making, and especially uh, those that are doing the same job as you. Yes? Um, it just strikes me that this is a violation of freedom of speech. Has there been a uh, federal action brought against violation of the First Amendment? You know, no. And I think a lot of it is that um, the, the companies will come up with all kinds of other excuses as to why they why yeah the yeah how you come up with an excuse it could be proprietary rights legal. i think proprietary rights would be free speech if you're an employer for the employee for that country company they can look into your they can they can look in your uh your computer and test they they be what and that guy in iowa was just fired for doing uh for sending out two pack uh, uh things to the staff Huh. Yeah, but that's, I mean, I, I, I this think, is pretty straightforward. I think corporate law comes along that. Yeah, and I think that the difficulty is that, um, you know, a, a lot of the times when people try to bring cases like this against their employers, um, there really isn't strong law in place again, why we need the Equal Rights Amendment, um, that, uh, you know, that, um, that people, you know, that that employees can can use to defend themselves um, against. There's sort of a patchwork of laws, uh, federal and some state laws that are are trying to address these issues, but they're not really doing it in a comprehensive way. And there's so many loopholes that companies are able to, um, you know, to say, well, well, I didn't fire them for disclosing or discussing their wages. I fired them because of you know some other reason. Um, and it's very difficult. It's always sort of on the employee to prove otherwise. Um, but unfortunately, this bill also um, failed. It made it out of the committee in the Senate, but it wasn't, um, it was never able to get enough votes to pass the full Senate. Um, so there were two different efforts uh, to raise the minimum wage. Um, so one was um, really a local effort. This was introduced by Representative Duplessis, who is a, a New Orleans representative, and uh, in his bill would have just basically taken away the state's ability to preempt local municipalities from um, passing ordinances or that you know that they could use to raise the minimum wage, to provide equal pay, to provide paid family leave. It would have addressed a lot of those um, economic justice uh, issues when it comes to um, employees at private firms in in the cities. So. Um, you know, this this would have basically just said, hey, you know, we're not asking the state to, to do this, you know, for everybody. We're just saying, well, if we want to do it in New Orleans or if we want to do it in Lafayette or in Shreveport, then we should be able to do that. And uh, unfortunately, the state is very concerned about local municipalities um, going out on their own and creating better working conditions and better wages for uh, for certain employees. So... Unfortunately, that, um, that effort also failed, as well as a proposed constitutional amendment that was introduced by Senator Troy Carter, and that amendment would have gone on the ballot in 2020, and it would have raised the minimum wage from $7.25 an hour to $9 an hour, and uh, that, that bill also failed. Um, the, the last that I had heard about it from Senator Carter towards the end of the the session was that he actually did think that he had about 20 votes in the Senate um, to pass it, which would have, you know, which was a, a pretty decent number for a raise in the minimum wage and certainly more than we've seen in past years. Uh, but for a constitutional amendment, you need two thirds of the Senate um, to, to agree to vote on it. And he wasn't anywhere near that. So he actually never even brought it up for a full vote. Um, there was a coalition that formed um, about mid-year last year uh, called Louisiana Families First, and 
It was uh, made up by, with a bunch of different kinds of organizations, everyone from sort of the United Way, um, the Partnership for Children and Families, the uh, Louisiana Budget Project, and then you know some of the women's rights advocacy organizations like Lift Louisiana were involved in the coalition uh, to try to pass the Louisiana Paid Family and Medical Leave Act. And what it would do is just require that companies uh, provide um, you know a modest amount of paid uh, family medical and family leave, and it would actually um, it would have been you know, not completely on the companies, but it would have been sort of like a payroll tax. Um, so employees would pay into uh, into the program. And, um, you know, it's not like the gold standard of paid family leave <laughs> policy, um, because it does, uh, you know, put a lot of um, the responsibility for creating the fund that you would then be able to access on the individual employees. And as we know, you know, people are making pretty low wages already in Louisiana. Uh, and I think a lot of uh, the really low wage workers in Louisiana may not have even been able to to uh, be eligible for the program, but it was going to be a start in the right direction, and um, there was, you know, a, a pretty good bipartisan, um, sort of conservative and progressive um, coalition behind it. And unfortunately, um, it, you know, it made it out of one of the committees, and then it went to um, the Senate Finance Committee, which is where pretty much all progressive economic policy in Louisiana goes to die. Um, <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so I, I don't even think it ever actually got a full hearing in that in that um, in that committee. So, you know, the coalition's not giving up. They're going to come back and, and try this again next year. And um, we're currently, you know, really trying to find a strong legislator that can carry it um, and really put their full weight behind it and um, line up, you know, a, a, you know, a kind of a bipartisan coalition of co-authors um, to introduce it as well. And then last was the pink tax. Um, so Senator, again, Senator J.P. Morrell um, carried this bill. This is something that he's tried to do several years, um, several budget sessions uh, since he's been in office. And this is his, his last year in the Senate. So um, we're not sure who's going who's gonna to pick this up because this one also did not did not make it, um, even though it did actually pass both houses. Um, and... Um, and then, but there were changes made to it, and so those changes had to be resolved. It went to what's called a conference committee, where, you know, a, a certain number of members of the House of Representatives and a certain mem number of senators get together and they work out the differences and they put together a report. And unfortunately, the 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 bill. Um, failed to get the signature of one legislator um, that was needed in order to um, to finalize the report and for the bill to finally pass. And so even though it was, it really had a lot of bipartisan support and passed overwhelmingly in both houses, um, just on this sort of like technicality, it failed. So we do think that we can, um, we can get it through next year. We just gotta find the right person to carry it, um, to carry it forward. So we'll talk a little bit more about each of these because I've got some video also to show you. Um, so uh, just for some context, Louisiana's pay gap is the worst in the nation and has been for years. No surprise, we're always at the bottom of every list that you don't want to be at the bottom of. Um, but I think that what's really stark about, um, about you know, how this is affecting um, you know, women in Louisiana and particularly black women in Louisiana because, um, because we're at the very bottom and black women are at the very bottom of the pay gap in Louisiana, they are at the very bottom of the pay gap in the entire country. And you know the result is that they um, earn only 48 cents to every dollar that men make. And that is just really, really shameful. And you know we have so many uh, you know, families that are being, you know, led by women of color in this state. And so this is just fine, you know, fiscally untenable for us to have this kind of a pay gap, um, especially for women of color. And so it's something that we really, really, really need to focus on. 
Um, and you can see the difference that, you know, when you take the sort of the overall women, so that's, you know, all women in Louisiana, um, it's 69 cents. So the, the gap even, you know, between women of color and sort of the, ge the general population of women um, is also pretty, pretty stark. Um, so, you know, what I think that we really need to start focusing on is how do we close the pay gap for women of color in the state? Because you know, if we can if we can close that gap, it's it's necessarily going to lift you know all the women in Louisiana's um, pay. Um, so, if we were to establish a nine dollar minimum wage, which let's be clear, that is still not a living wage. Um, uh, over uh, 200,000 people in Louisiana would have gotten a raise, and you know, polling. Um, has been done on this issue over the last several years, and every single poll comes out exactly the same, that you know, three quarters of the people in this state support raising the minimum wage. Um, and you know, I think it's, you know, it's again, really shameful that, uh, that this is you know, an issue that has such overwhelming public support, yet our legislators are not, are not voting for it. And you know, I think that what that really says is that uh, we need to figure out a way to have that, you know, 76% of people in Louisiana that support this to really make this an issue with their legislators um, and, you know, make sure that their legislators really understand that this is something that, you know, that they want as voters. And we focus on this issue because, um, you know, uh, two-thirds of the workers who would actually receive a wage increase um, are women because that's how many um, of the population that's making minimum wage are women in Louisiana. Oh, I think I went back. Um, so when the coalition got together, they did uh, some polling uh, and, you know, some focus groups on paid family medical leave because they really sort of wanted to understand, you know, again, where people in Louisiana were. Um, and, you know, only 35% of new moms in Louisiana are able to take any form of leave after childbirth. And that's even below the national average of 55%. And again, the polling came back on this one, overwhelming support for paid, um, paid family and medical leave. And when we, you know, start talking about the next, you know, the next kind of big issue that we're going to get to, you know, it's pretty, uh, you know, it's pretty unbelievable that we would live in a state where um, we're not going to give, you know, moms or dads, you know, new parents time off to, you know, to welcome a, a child into their family um, when we're, you know, so committed to making sure that every single pregnancy ends ends in birth. So, um, so the pink tax um, is, you know, I, I I I was calling it the tampon tax, but that really doesn't quite sum it up. Um, so what this would have done is actually eliminate the sales tax that um, the state and local um, governments charge on um, diapers and feminine hygiene products. So we exempt all kinds of things in the state of Louisiana from sales tax, both at the state and local level, including things like farm equipment and prescription drugs and groceries. So even, you know, your sodas or your Cheetos are, you know, exempt from sales tax. And so all this would have done was to eliminate the sales tax on diapers and feminine hygiene products. And it doesn't seem like a lot of money, but in, um, in a place like uh, Jefferson Parish, for example, the sales tax um, for state and local government is 10.5%. And so if you look at, um, you know, one family, one child, and, you know, diaper age child for the year, that's $70 um, for that child that year that they, that that family would send. I mean, that pays an electricity bill. So, uh, it, you know, it really does add up. And the opposition to it obviously is, well, you know, it's going to cost the state, you know, over nine million dollars. Um, that that's revenue that the state and local government, you know, state government is not going to be bringing in. Um, but I think the alternative way to think about that is that it would save women and families nine million dollars. Um, 
So uh, unfortunately, you know, you, uh, you heard the story, but I'll, uh, I want to play this little bit of video of uh, the, uh, the testimony that Senator Morrell gave uh, on this bill when it was in the committee, because uh, I think it's pretty, uh, it's pretty illuminating and just like how difficult it is for the people that were going to oppose this to really justify opposing it. All right, um, Senator Hewitt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, how do we decide what are the uh, the essential the essentials from a tax policy standpoint? I think we're making things more complicated by adding more and more exemptions. But you could use cloth diapers like we did back in the day. And cloth diapers would also be exempt under this legislation. So, I mean, I, I if your suggestion is that poor women should go make their own cloth diapers. I think that is a position. I don't think it's a realistic position considering my wife and I actually did cloth. The amount of money you have to pay for the chemicals, additional items to sanitize cloth diapers, to make them available to be used on children without creating rashes and the like, is very expensive. Honestly, if you did all the things required to do cloth diapers and maintain them and measured it with disposable, disposable is measurably cheaper. So, I mean, though cloth diapers are better for the environment, mind you, like many organic things, it's not the cheaper alternative. You actually, when you have to bring your child to daycare, you have to be responsible yep. for you insuring their diapers. diapers. And so this can actually, I mean, this can be an impediment for many families if they can't afford those diapers in terms of being able to even put their child in daycare. In, the, in every daycare that I've experienced with my three children, part of the daycare agreement is you bring diapers, you bring wipes. And I cannot imagine the difficulty and embarrassment yes. you have a child that you're barely keeping in daycare and you can't make end meet to bring the diapers or... If you're breaking your back to put your kid through daycare and you have to go to a diaper bank to hope they have diapers in stock to meet the criteria, because with most daycares, the moment you don't bring diapers is the moment they tell you you have to keep your child at home until you have diapers. Good point. Senator Hewitt never got it. She voted against the, she voted against the bill. All right. So... Um, SB 184, which was introduced by Senator Milkovich, um, was a proposal. You may have read about it or heard about it as a as a heartbeat ban, which um, uh, I, I think actually mischaracterizes what the what the bill does. Essentially, it would ban abortions as early as six weeks, which is um, earlier than most women even know that they're pregnant. So essentially, it would have been. Um, you know, a, a complete ban on abortions for most women in Louisiana. Um, it, this was a very, th this bill had more discussion and debate than I have seen on an abortion restriction in the last five years um, that I've been paying close attention to, to these bills. And at every step of the way, we had lawmakers that were um, expressing concern that the, uh, about you know, how early um, in pregnancy this bill was, and also that there were no exceptions um, provided in this bill for, uh, for rape and incest um, victims or survivors. And um, so there were several points where legislators did try to add uh, those amendments and they were, they were opposed. And um, and the first time was in the Senate committee uh, where the bill was first heard. And the Louisiana Right to Life got up to, um, to oppose the amendment that had just, that had just been passed and, and put on the bill in that committee. Um, and then the bill was actually, uh, the amendment was stripped off the bill. Yes? I'd like to add something to the, um, the exception that they do have to save the life of the mother is so incredibly strenuous to satisfy, right? right? doctor has to sign an affidavit and it has to go on record. They have to keep the records for the woman for what, like seven years? Yes. Something like that. So not only is it uh, intimidating physically, but it's, it's intimidating in terms of privacy. Right. Uh, thing too. So it essentially does, does not support the, uh, supporting the life of the mother. Right. 
Yes, yes. It would be very difficult for a doctor to make that determination and to comply. Right. That's right. That's right. Thank you. So, yes, it's playing. All right. Go ahead, Mr. Clapper. Thank you, Senators. Senators, Ben Clapper, Executive Director of Louisiana Right to Life. We're a state pro-life organization that's been around since 1970, working to restore the right to life through education, activism, uh, legislation, and service. Uh, we uh, came supporting the bill today. We believe that every unborn child, every human being for that matter, deserves a, a fundamental human right to life. And uh, the fact that the child has a heartbeat is one of the clearest markers of the humanity of the child. And because of that, we support that concept. However, we, we did, do oppose the amendment that added rape and incest to the bill. And that's very concerning for us as an organization. Our law, as one of the leading pro-life states in the country, uh, has uh, we have no rape and incest exceptions in other portions of our law. And so it's, uh, this is concerning that we have added this amendment to it. Uh, we would uh, even uh, potentially consider not supporting the legislation if this amendment is put on the bill. Uh, every unborn child, no matter of how they were conceived, deserves the right to life. Thank you so much. Uh, every unborn child, no matter how they were conceived, deserves the right to life. They deserve the same protection, no matter the, how they were brought into this world. And so we would be concerned about that amendment on the bill. So in that committee, the amendment was proposed. It was, uh, it was added to the bill without any objection. And then after Mr. Clapper gave his testimony, they voted to rescind the amendment off the bill. It's pretty, it was pretty incredible. Um, when the bill came to the House side, Representative Ted James again tried to add the rape and incest exception on, and there was a lot of testimony, over two hours of testimony, um, you know, of conservatives and, you know, progressives um, coming up and talking about, you know, whether they agreed with the amendment or didn't agree with the amendment. Um, so I've just, I've, I've put together just a, a, a clip uh, here. That, you know, we had, we had to face a very hard choice. And I know that the governor has faced a similar choice. Does this bill, is it trying to tell a woman what she can or cannot do with her body? Well, I believe in a woman's choice. Um, I'm very familiar with the story, the governor's story and his family. And now I'm familiar with the story of, of Representative Hodges. And one thing that was, that was very consistent in both of those stories is the fact that they had a conversation as a family. And they made a choice. It's a family decision. That's not a decision for us. We are not that important to make that decision. Again, if we could pass a bill that would allow us to have, let the mother choose. If you want choice, let her choose to execute the rapist. That's fine. I'm for that. I'm not for this bill. And I, I believe that my choice ends when another life begins. Uh, it's not easy. It's not easy if somebody's been raped. But there was a choice. She gave me up. The, the word that I keep hearing from everybody is, it starts with a C and ends with an E. Choice. Yeah, it was pretty remarkable. Um, so, yeah, as you all know, the bill did pass, and um, it is not in effect because Louisiana has started this new interesting thing <laughs> where they um, pass unconstitutional laws, but then they say that they're only effective um, if the law is upheld um, in court from another state. So they're waiting to see Mississippi's litigation go forward um, before, uh, before making their law effective. Uh, so it... It's, it's interesting because I think this is a reaction to them actually acknowledging that they are spending way too much money defending unconstitutional restrictions on abortion. And so they are trying to uh, prevent um, organizations like, like mine from uh, taking, you know, from immediately suing them and taking them to court on a, on a bill like this. So the other big one that we worked on this year was a constitutional amendment um, so, uh, to, the, to the Louisiana Constitution. Uh, it would have 
the amendment basically would say that no provision of the Constitution protects the right to abortion or requires the funding of abortion. Uh, and again, this provides no exception for rape and incest. And, um, you know, right now it really would not have any effect on um, women's access, but if, if Roe v. Wade were ever overturned um, or something like that, you know, happened where the protections provided by the federal government were eroded, then this constitutional amendment would hold and, uh, and you know, women would not be able to access an abortion in Louisiana. Um, it was uh, proposed to be on the ballot in 2019, and then there was an effort to get the date changed, so it'll be on the ballot in 2020. I rise in opposition to this bill. I'm sure many of you already know that, but I'm really coming down today because there is a, a, a line, a vein of rhetoric in this debate, which I think is very disingenuous. <clears throat> this is not a pro-life bill, it is a pro-birth bill. And let me be more clear in what I, how I explain that. This legislature has voted repeatedly in support of pro-birth. We, in this legislature, have failed. I'll give you a couple examples. We have failed to repeal or have significant debate on the death penalty. That is a pro-life stance. You can give your rationale as the caveats as to why there should be exceptions to life, but that is a pro-life issue it's established by almost every religious head in the entire world. That's one example. This is a pro-birth bill and a pro-birth state because we don't legitimately accept or support health care expansion for these mothers having children. Currently, our Attorney General is fighting to repeal the Affordable Care Act with no funded replacement. So we support birth, but we don't support the health care provided for the mother, the health care provided for the children, or health care in general. That has been established. We have people who come here who vilify people on welfare, who in the midst of the debate on how old we should allow children to have babies, make the comment that it's better for them to get married at 10 when they're having the baby than be single. Our fixation is so much on micromanaging the family. Once again, that is a pro-birth stance, not a pro-life stance, because the life of a 10-year-old married to a 40-year-old is not much of a life at all. We are a pro-birth state because there are children currently languishing in foster care, and as a state, we've established that we don't want non-traditional families adopting children. So you might have a non-traditional family, and by non-traditional I mean non-traditional by our state's definition, of two men or two women who desperately want to raise a child, a child who's in foster care, who's getting limited services, limited support, but we have decided as a state, we know better than them, so their lives are gonna continue to be miserable in the foster care system because we put up hurdles each day to allow for same-sex couples to adopt children and provide loving homes. Pro-birth, not pro-life. I have really struggled through this debate because I think that people are more concerned with how they phrase things than simply saying where they're at. And if you support this bill as a pro-birth bill, please say that and stop misrepresenting that you're pro-life, whether it's for these mothers or for these children. That was one of the best speeches that I've ever seen, uh, which is why I let it run long. But um, yeah, I think that pretty much sums up how the debate went on uh, on the abortion restrictions this session. Um, I want to do a time check and just see if folks are interested in the litigation. If not, we can skip it. Sally is, show of hands. I'm going to try to make this not super nerdy. Okay. Um, so, uh, in 2014, Louisiana passed a law requiring that doctors who provide abortions have to have admitting privileges at a local hospital. So that means they have to be able to admit a patient. Hospitals 
really only grant privileges, those kinds of privileges to doctors who are going to admit a lot of patients um, and who are, you know, really going to be active in the, you know, the hospital system. And abortion providers don't admit patients because abortion is a safe procedure. And so there are rarely complications and, and even more and even more rarely complications that require hospitalization. Uh, in addition, hospitals are not you know, interested in, in having abortion providers sort of on, you know, their roster of doctors um, that are providing care at that hospital because protesters. So anyway, Louisiana passed this law in 2014. It was exactly the same as the law that passed in Texas um, the year earlier. And the law in Texas went all the way to the Supreme Court. In 2016, the Supreme Court looked at the law in Texas and said, this law has no medical benefit. It's just, this is just a ruse. You're just trying to close clinics down. That's against the Constitution. And we are overturning this law in Texas. You can't do this. But Louisiana, our attorney general said, well, we're going to keep fighting for our law um, regardless because we just disagree with the Supreme Court's decision and we're going to ignore that precedent and we're going to keep going forward. And so in the fall of, la of last year, um, our law was before the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals and which is a very conservative uh, court circuit, and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld Louisiana's law and said, okay, the law actually is constitutional. We, you know, don't think that the Supreme Court precedent in the Texas case really applies. Really, these doctors could comply with the law if they just tried harder, and we think that the law is fine, and we're going to allow it to go into effect. Um, and so the, the uh, people that were fighting on the side of the abortion providers in the state asked the Supreme Court on an emergency basis to, um, to review the case. And in, in March, yes, in, um, in early March, the Supreme Court stepped in and said, hold on, don't let this law go into effect. We, we might want to take a look at this because we just decided the same law two years ago so um, we're going to block the law for now while we decide whether or not we really want to dig into this case. So where we're at with that is that in April, um, the plaintiffs in the case, so the, uh, the uh, lawyers that are, that are representing the abortion providers in the state, filed a petition, which is called a cert petition, with the Supreme Court that says, you know, this is our objection to the law, and we, you know, we we think that you should um, strike the law down. And then in May, Louisiana filed what they are calling a counter cert petition. So they are saying, if the Supreme Court takes this case up, we want you to both uphold our law, and we also want you to make a decision that abortion doctors cannot stand in for their patients um, in these lawsuits anymore, which would mean that in order for a abortion restriction to be challenged in court, actual patients would have to be the named plaintiffs in the lawsuit, which is, as you can imagine, very, very, very difficult, um, which is why the courts have always recognize the ability of doctors to represent their, their own patients in these cases. <laughs> so what we're waiting for now is in October, the, the Supreme Court will decide on whether it's going to, what's called grant cert. Um, and um, there's three possible outcomes um, with that. So they could either grant the cert petition, which says, okay, we're going to have oral arguments and you guys come argue your sides. Um, or they can deny cert, which would mean that the law would go into effect immediately. And um, that would mean that most, if not all, the, the abortion clinics in Louisiana would close immediately. Um, or what they could do is um, what the petitioners are asking for, which is a summary reversal. So essentially they would say, we're not even going to hear this. We already decided it. This is ridiculous. We're just closing this down. We're shutting it down. The law is overturned and let's move on. 
Um, so that's the, the last one that I gave you, the summary reversal is like what we're really hoping for in this case. Um, if they grant cert, then the oral arguments would be in January or February, um, and then um, a decision would likely come down in June. So that's where we are. So summary reversal, um, grant cert, we have no idea what the outcome of that might be, um, and then deny cert, the law would go into effect and we would close down you know, at least two, maybe all three of the remaining abortion clinics in the state. So we are preparing for that. Um, before we get into the what can we do, let me just pause and see if anyone has questions on any of the stuff that we, I've gone over, because there's a lot of information. You know, what are we going to do after today from Morales? I know, right? I know. We all really... I can say is thank God for the black office. Only. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think that kind of gets to one of the, one of the what can we do's, which is you can vote, you can bring other people to vote, you can register voters, and you can either run for office yourself, which I know that we have some people in the room um, uh, that are running for office, and if you want to get up and say wh why you're running and what you're running for, um, we are a nonpartisan organization and can't endorse candidates, but, you know, we're happy to, um, you know, and also people should find someone that is running that you believe in and work on their campaign, um, volunteer for their campaign. So, yeah. Yeah. Running for office isn't easy, so we think, yeah. So they, thank you, Leslie, and, that, and you make a really good point about legislators that actually just don't even show up to vote, because there are actually quite a lot of them. Um, we are in the process of putting together a 
you know, a sort of a shame list of legislators that consistently um, are absent um, because we, sometimes people are legitimately absent, but there are a lot of legislators that are just not taking votes. So that's a good point. Uh, just one thing that I just recently heard about the buzz, um, which I didn't know, actually. Um, so in the special session, he was talking about the leading factor of why it went. And I was talking to for they had it all kind of wrapped up and they spent two days playing with him um, trying to get him to vote and he wouldn't actually come down to vote because he was sick. Um, and he ended up I had spoken to a senator about you know just this and trying to get him to vote, just vote. <laughs> One way or another vote. Um, and he ended up voting against it so it ended up um, but that's just a vote. And that's a luxury that 
I don't have as a teacher. But I'll tell you what, when I go to the legislature in the spring, I will be hustling for teachers and for families. And I will be defending our veterans, and I'll be looking out for our best interest. I am not a legislator of leisure. I'm not going to go to the legislature and piddle around and not show up to vote or decide that, uh, or wait around for something really good to come and sweeten the deal for me. That's not my agenda at all. I don't think we can have more teachers and everyday people on the other side of those committee desks because I'm tired of being an advocate and walking away 50% of the time feeling like we have no hope, 20% of the time like we actually succeed in the legislature, and I don't know. It's jealous to think that 30% is like we do this again. But, you know, Michelle, I know that we've been on these different coalitions together here in the DPEC, which I'm so proud to be a member of now. I mean, I really feel like things are changing uh, in our state. So absolutely go and support people who are in the district. Um, run. Just run. It costs a little bit, but um, if you've got a good message, people are going to come out, they're going to push you, they're going to support you. So, one of the Thank you. Thanks for coming. I'm going to look for that email. Okay. I want to take a look at that. Yeah. Thank you, Sally. Didn't you? So we, you know, we appreciate people that are running for office, and we appreciate people who are volunteering for campaigns, and we appreciate people who are doing simple things like having conversations with, you know, your friends and family members about these issues or coworkers. Um, picking up the phone and calling your legislators um, when you get an email, you know, asking you to do so about these issues. And, uh, you know, we are going to be working um, over the fall on focus groups um, to uh, try to figure out the best way to, to talk to people about the constitutional amendment um, to ban abortions in Louisiana. And, you know, we would love for any and all of you to be part of, of those conversations with us and, um, you know, help us work on that campaign. Um, we, you know, we won't be getting the campaign actually rolling until next, uh, next year, but we're going to be trying to lay some groundwork for it before then. Um, but one of the things, you know, I think that oftentimes we spend a lot of time um, you know, picking up the phone and calling when we're angry at our legislators about something. And what we don't do often enough is thank them when they do the right thing. Um, and so uh, I guess maybe we can open it up for more questions or discussion before we do the thank you exercise. <laughs> All right, good point. Maybe we don't have questions. All right. I was thorough. I think you were very thorough. Um, so, um, so I, I yeah. Um, not really sure how to say this without sounding negative, but I, I, I don't know that it's the Louisiana Democratic Party so on board with um, getting resources out to helping candidates run, um, to flip a seat especially. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any advice on, or? No. no. I, I mean. mean I, guess, I guess I would say I was a little disappointed since I've been running, you know, um, or since I put my, you know, so I don't know. I just feel like this isn't I mean, I think that that's a gen. It's a general challenge across the South for progressives. I mean, I think that you know we see you see this all across the country that there was sort of a systematic disinvestment in you know progressive candidates. So the question was, you know, why is there not more support for from the part from the Democratic Party um, to candidates that are, you know, that are stepping up to run for office? And I'm not, I don't, 
I don't, I don't work for the Democratic Party, so I can't no, speak I, I, for them, I, I, but... Um, I, I guess I was, maybe that was just more of a statement to say that it, it has been a little disturbing. Like, I can almost see why people have that. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think that it's... Unless it's, it's a guarantee to be flipped. Yeah. challenge that Yeah, I think it, it I is. I haven't spent too long, so <laughs> I have all the experience. But I, I would say, yeah. Yeah, I, I wish that I had some better advice for you. Um, but I, I mean, I do think that this is a, a challenge that, you know, we see, you know, all across the sort of the red states is that there's just not, there's not an investment in candidates. There's also not an investment in progressive organizations. Um, you know that are that are working to try to you know change policies and and work with the legislators you know the handful of legislators that we do have so i i do think that um that is changing but i don't know it's gonna i don't and, and, yeah and women running or you know different trying, trying to step out um but it, it's more of a momentum problem for people and not Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So I'm um, should I should I do the mic? As long as you repeat the question, okay. I think we'll be okay. It's kind of a, a statement and a question. Okay. So I'm the advisor for an AEWP at SLCC, and a lot of times when um, conversations around reproductive justice comes up, it's so taboo here, being that Lafayette and the surrounding Acadiana area is so predominantly Catholic. People don't, they either don't want to talk about it or they're steadfast in their pro-life um, stories that they don't want to consider any, anything else. So what kind of advice do you have as far as how to open up a dialogue to even just to talk about it in a way that's more educational and not a debate? So the question is a good one. The question is about um, having a conversation uh, with people uh, around the issues of reproductive justice, abortion access, I would imagine, is the most contentious um, part of that discussion. Um, when you know people feel uncomfortable talking about it, or um, they are, you know, they've taken a, a pro-life position or pro-birth position, I guess, as uh, Senator Morrell would call it. And so, we have been thinking a lot about this, um, and I think that th there are there are people that you're never going to change their mind. You know, they. They have, they have staked out their position and it's not movable. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's rooted in, you know, what I would say maybe, you know, misguided or, or misunderstood ideas around morality and religiosity and et cetera. Then there are people who are uncomfortable with the idea of it, um, but they're, you know, they're not sort of, they're not taking a, a radical position around it. And, and you know, those are the people that I think you can have a conversation with around, maybe you have an objection to it, but is this really the government's business? Um, because really that's what it is. It's the government legislating people's healthcare decisions and there's no other healthcare decision that anyone would make that that these people would find that that's that's tolerable for the government to say you can or cannot have this access to this healthcare procedure so i think that that is we have found that that is something that seems to resonate with people that are cons you know conservative and 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 maybe come from this like we don't really want the government all up in our business kind of position the other thing is, 
maybe they're not going to ever get to a place where they are comfortable with people having an abortion. But we can't force every woman who gets pregnant to carry a pregnancy to term and then not have a supportive, you know, policy and government program structure in the state that, you know, that would make sure that those women don't crash into poverty, that their children are taken care of, that they, you know, that even going to the hospital to give birth isn't going to, you know, put them in, in bankruptcy. Um, so I think that that's, that's, that those are some of the conversations that we've been having with people in Monroe, you know, um, and in Alexandria. Um, you know, we, we're trying to build a constituency I mean, ideally, we would like for women to have access, but if we lose access <laughs> in the state, then we need to make sure that women can prevent an unplanned pregnancy, that they have access to birth control um, and can afford that birth control. We need to make sure that they have access to the sexual health information that they need to un even understand how to prevent an unplanned pregnancy. Um, we, you know, so, uh, and we also need to make sure that, you know, families are economically secure so that if faced with an unplanned pregnancy, it's not, you know, it's not a decision that the family has to think, you know, we, we can't afford to have another kid, right? Um, which is, you know, a number one reason that women give for um, for terminating a pregnancy is because they can't afford to have another children. Most women who have abortions already have children. So I think those are some of the conversations that we need to that we need to have. So rather than screaming at each other and trying to change each other's mind on the issue around abortion, can maybe we can find common ground on the issue of you know, the government not regulating what people do in terms of their health care and their bodies, find common ground on making sure that people have access to sex education and, you know, reproductive health, preventative reproductive health care services, and that we have, you know, an, e you know, an economically secure, you know, family structure, programs and policies in place that are supporting families, um, because that, that's what we need in order to, you know, to deal with, you know, the impacts of, an, you know, a future where we may not have any, you know, any clinics where women can access an abortion anyway. So that's, that would be my suggestion. Sure. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so I've, I've highlighted three. Um, folks here. So Terry Landry and um, Vincent Pierre both voted against the constitutional amendment and the um, six-week abortion ban. Uh, and Senator Boudreaux worked to change the, um, the date of the constitutional amendment. Uh, Senator Boudreaux also um, consistent, um, consistently uh, shows up uh, in support of some of the other sort of economic justice issues as well. So these are legislators that, you know, live in, in, in an area where they're probably getting a lot of pressure from, you know, anti-abortion uh, constituents um, and, you know, also under pressure from the business lobby uh, in the legislature, and yet they, um, they did the right thing. So they should be thanked. Yes. That's right. Hmm. Yeah. So um, I don't have a script. Um, I've given you the context, and Chantrell has. We have a limited number of thank you notes. Um, <laughs> we may have enough. <laughs> Um, so I would encourage you, so this is what I'm asking you to do. Pick one of these folks, um, address, you know, um, 
address the thank you note to them. Um, thank them for whatever you want to thank them for. I, you know, I told you, uh, you know, how they voted, and then I'll collect them and I will address them and, and mail them to the legislators. He's retiring, is that? He'd still thank him. Yeah. So um, we're gonna kind of wrap things up, um, give you guys opportunities to write your thank you notes. Um, the handouts that I have are the voting records from uh, this, this past legislative session. It's really difficult to get all of the House members on one piece of paper. Um, so I have a digital versions of these on our website and I will email them to you if you gave me your email address when you signed in. Um, so sometimes it's a, bit, a little bit easier to see uh, that way. And um, we, have, we have these voting records for past years as well. Uh, we also will create legislative pro, legislator profiles for the individual legislators. So if you're interested in finding out sort of, you know, the last four or five years of, uh, of historical votes of your legislator, um, we're happy to, to create those profiles for you. And you can use those to inform yourself about how you're gonna vote in the future. Um, and with that, I guess I again just want to thank um, Chantrell and uh, and Sally and the college and AOC for um, for working with us on this program tonight. And thank you all so much for coming. That's it.